I have a new game we can play. Hey, I'm Sapphire. Want to hear something scary? Our next chapter is a creepy pasta written by Perfect Circle 35. During my childhood, my family was like a drop of water in a vast river, never remaining in one location for long. We were living in a house just outside the bustling metropolis of New Vineyard, Maine. Population, 643. The day after my fifth birthday, I came down with a fever. The doctor said I had mononucleosis, which meant no rough play and more fever for at least another three weeks. It was horrible timing to be bedridden. We were in the process of packing our things to move to Pennsylvania, and most of my things were already packed away in boxes, leaving my room barren. My mother brought me ginger ale and books several times a day, and these served the function of being my primary form of entertainment for the next few weeks. Boredom always looms just around the corner. I don't exactly recall how I met Mr. Widemouth. I think it was about a week after I was diagnosed with mono. My first memory of the small creature was asking him if he had a name. He told me to call him Mr. Widemouth because his mouth was large. In fact, everything about him was large in comparison to his body, his head, his eyes, his crooked ears, but his mouth was by far the largest. You look kind of like a Furby. Furby? What's a Furby? You know, the toy. The little robot with the big ears. You can pet and feed them, almost like a real pet. Oh, you don't need one of those. They aren't the same as having a real friend. I remember Mr. Widemouth disappearing every time my mother stopped by to check in on me. I don't want your parents to see me because I'm afraid they won't let us play anymore. The third or fourth morning after I met him, he greeted me with a large smile on his face. I have a new game we can play. We have to wait until after your mother comes to check on you because she can't see us play it. It's a secret game. After my mother delivered more books and soda at the usual time, Mr. Widemouth slipped out from under the bed and tugged my hand. We have to go to the room at the end of this hallway. I objected at first, as my parents had forbidden me to leave my bed without their permission, but Mr. Widemouth persisted until I gave in. The room in question had no furniture or wallpaper. Its only distinguishing feature was a window opposite the doorway. Mr. Widemouth darted across the room and gave the window a firm push, flinging it open. He then beckoned me to look out at the ground below. We were on the second story of the house, but it was on a hill, and from this angle, the drop was farther than two stories due to the incline. I like to play pretend up here. I pretend that there's a big soft trampoline below this window, and I jump. If you pretend hard enough, you bounce back up like a feather. I want you to try. I was a five-year-old with a fever, so only a hint of skepticism darted through my thoughts as I looked down and considered the possibility. It's a long drop, I said. But that's all part of the fun. It wouldn't be fun if it was only a short drop. If it were that way, you may as well just bounce on a real trampoline. I toyed with the idea, but the realist in me prevailed. I don't know if I have enough imagination. I could get hurt. Mr. Widemouth's face contorted into a snarl, but only for a moment. If you say so, he said. He spent the rest of the day under my bed, quiet as a mouse. The following morning, Mr. Widemouth arrived holding a small box. I want to teach you how to juggle, he said. Here are some things you can use to practice. I looked in the box. It was full of knives. My parents will kill me. I shouted, horrified that Mr. Widemouth had brought knives into my room, objects that my parents would never allow me to touch. Mr. Widemouth frowned. It's fun to juggle with these. I want you to try it. I pushed the box away. Knives aren't safe to just throw in the air. Mr. Widemouth's frown deepened into a scowl. He took the box of knives and slid under my bed, remaining there the rest of the day. I began to wonder how often he was under me. I started having trouble sleeping after that. Mr. Widemouth often woke me up at night, saying he put a real trampoline under the window, a big one, one that I couldn't see in the dark. I always declined and tried to go back to sleep, but Mr. Widemouth persisted. Sometimes he stayed by my side until early in the morning, encouraging me to jump. He wasn't so fun to play with anymore. My mother came to me one morning and told me I had her permission to walk around outside. She thought the fresh air would be good for me, especially after being confined to my room for so long. Ecstatic, I put on my sneakers and trotted out to the back porch, yearning for the feeling of sun on my face. 
Mr. Widemouth was waiting for me. I have something I want you to see, he said. I must have given him a weird look because he then said, It's safe, I promise. I followed him to the beginning of a deer trail which ran through the woods behind the house. This is an important path, he explained. I've had a lot of friends about your age. When they were ready, I took them down this path to a special place. You weren't ready yet, but one day, I hope to take you there. I returned to the house, wondering what kind of place lay beyond that trail. Two weeks after I met Mr. Widemouth, the last load of our things had been packed into a moving truck. I considered telling Mr. Widemouth that I would be leaving, but even at five years old, I was beginning to suspect that perhaps the creature's intentions were not to my benefit, despite what he said otherwise. For this reason, I decided to keep my departure a secret. My father and I were in the truck at 4 a.m. I saw Mr. Widemouth's silhouette in my bedroom window. He stood motionless until the truck was about to turn onto the main road. He gave a pitiful little wave goodbye, steak knife in hand. I didn't wave back. Years later, I returned to New Vineyard. The piece of land our house stood upon was empty except for the foundation, as a house burned down a few years after my family left. Out of curiosity, I followed the trail that Mr. Widemouth had shown me. Part of me expected him to jump out from behind a tree, but I felt that Mr. Widemouth was gone, somehow tied to the house that no longer existed. The trail ended at the New Vineyard Memorial Cemetery. I noticed that many of the tombstones belong to children. Want some Snarl swag? Head on over to our website at snarl.com. Want to see something scary live? Check out the video in the description below for more information on how you can demand your city. Like this video if it gave you the chills. And don't forget to subscribe to Snarled and our sister channels Hissy Fit and Slay Tricks. If you or anyone you know have any unique paranormal experiences, DM me on Instagram and I might feature your story. Even if it doesn't fit in with the current theme, it might fit one in the future. And I do my best to read and respond to everybody, so please be patient with me. Until next time, sweet dreams.